Hello and welcome along to the industry analysis for the management case study of November 2018. Here we're going to be looking at the real world beverages and soft drinks industry. We have distilled the key information, data points and trends from this industry. We've analysed it from a structural point of view and various other components as well to make it easier for you to navigate through the pre-scene and to anticipate some of the issues that are likely to come up on exam day in November. So before we get into the details, let me just give you a quick overview of the content of this industry analysis. We're going to begin with the macro view. We're going to be looking at some global growth and sales trends. We'll be narrowing in then on regional sales and regional uh, developments and also on some of the major countries, the major markets in the beverages industry and drawing out some key uh, trends in recent years and also looking at some projections going forward. From there then we'll move into the specifics of the structure of the industry, the supply, the manufacture, distribution channels and issues pertaining to licensing which is important in this context as we'll see. From there then we're going to move to the consumer focus, we're going to look at consumer trends and changes in recent years, we're going to be looking at demographics, key demographic points and also attitudes and preferences with respect to this industry and how that might influence things like product uh, selection, product uh, planning and pricing and so on. And then from there we'll move finally to the issue of governments as a key stakeholder in this industry, how they affect the industry in several ways in terms of regulations, health campaigns and concerns and initiatives. And then also we're going to look at how uh, the industry and companies within the industry have in various ways responded to these government initiatives and requirements and interventions with various kinds of innovations. And then finally, we will draw out some conclusions from everything that's come before, tie it all together and focus in on some of the key points uh, that we have drawn out from all of those previous sections. So before we get into some of the details, let me just give you a quick overview here. I'm looking at the breakdown of this industry in terms of product categories. It's good to get a good sense of the overall structure in terms of the products and the kinds of uh, drinks that are made available within this industry. So this is the beverage industry, broadly speaking, which is sub uh, divided into non-alcoholic and alcoholic beverages. And of course, we're going to be focusing on the non-alcoholic beverages in this case, because of course, the case study, the pre-scene that we're dealing with here focuses on non-alcoholic beverages. And that is further subdivided then into six segments, as you can see here. First, we have carbonated soft drinks, colas and non-colas, or CSDs for short for the carbonated soft drink section. Then we have fruit beverages, and this includes things like fruit juices with 100% juice. So that would be, for example, your breakfast juice, your Tropicana, and things like that. Then we have fruit drinks, which are actually a mix of a fruit base or a fruit syrup, which uses real fruit, uh, real fruit extracts uh, in combination with uh, a lot of water. And then the juice drinks finally are basically uh, flavored drinks. So they use artificial flavorings to replicate fruit flavors and again, again, mixing them with large amounts of water and uh, in many cases with sweeteners and sugars as well. Then we have bottled waters. Uh, we're going to be focusing a lot on bottled waters and the, the importance of this segment in later slides. But you can see there that's subdivided into unflavored waters and flavored waters. Unflavored waters would include both still and sparkling or carbonated waters. And then the flavored waters will include uh, uh, drinks that use mostly a vast majority of water with a small amount of flavoring based on things like fruits as well. Then we have these functional drinks in the next category, and this uh, includes a lot of, again, very important uh, drink categories from the perspective of growth and changes in the industry, which we'll come back to. You have energy drinks that would include things like the popular Monster and Red Bull drinks. You have ready to drink teas and coffees. These will be kind of uh, often mixed with fruit flavorings as well. You see things like Nest tea and Lipton iced tea would be considered ready to drink teas. And then finally, relaxation drinks. These are mixed in with, these are in the same uh, kind of broad category as energy drinks. You'll see a lot of these uh, in the same area of your supermarket, for example. And then finally, uh, on the right, we have the sport drink segment, which includes liquid and powdered uh, flavored drinks. Uh, so the liquid obviously would be things like Lucozade, Gatorade and Powerade or some of the major international brands. 
And then powdered, you can get them in concentrated form as well. And you might be looking at things like sport mixes that include protein powders in that category as well. And then other is everything else that's not included in those first five categories. But we're going to be focusing primarily on those first five categories because they cover most of the major drink types that are being dealt with in this uh, pre-scene case. So let's start with some of the most global uh, trends in recent years. We're looking here at growth figures from 2012 to 2017 and the difference in graphic form you can see there in this uh, graph on the left. All of these categories more or less uh, overlap with those with which we were dealing in the previous section. So you can see here in terms of growth, carbonates are at a very modest 9.4%. And then above that, you can see a uh, bottled water at 28%. Now, it's important to bear in mind when it comes to carbonates or carbonated soft drinks, the, it's understandable why we might see relatively modest growth figures in that case, because this is possibly the most mature market and the largest in absolute numbers in terms of consumption. The carbonated soft drinks industry, despite lower growth figures, is the one that has the most in terms of absolute consumption rates. But it cannot be denied that there are big changes on the horizon for the carbonated soft drink segment, as we'll see in later slides. And it's important to keep an eye there on some of these other categories in terms of their very impressive growth. RTDs, you can see down below, the ready to drink teas, for example, are 37.1% 30, growth from 2012 to 2017. And these specialty Asian drinks as well, 467 that would overlap roughly with that relaxation sub-segment that we mentioned in the previous slide. You can see here, this is soda consumption, which is another uh, word for these carbonated soft drinks. It's rising at about the same rate as population, world population. So we're not seeing particularly spectacular growth there. It's tracking world population growth, which is not very outstanding. But as I said, the carbonated soft drinks market is the most mature and in terms of absolute numbers, the largest. So perhaps not surprising that there will be more modest growth figures in that segment. A nice little qualitative analysis here uh, of this particular data that we're presenting to you. So it says, while the industry is expected to experience modest growth driven by more innovative products and the changing demographic trends, the actual industry growth rate is expected to lag behind GDP, GDP growth. In fact, growth is expected to be slow in the post-recession economy. Existing demand patterns are expected to change as consumers become more health conscious. We're going to come back to this health consciousness issue because it is absolutely crucial in this industry. And this is from a really useful uh, article. I would recommend that you take a look at it. It's called Breaking Down the Chain, A Guide to the Soft Drinks Industry. And we have, of course, made the link to that article uh, available to you at the end of this presentation. So global trends in recent years. This is looking at soft drinks specifically uh, worldwide from 2012 to 2017. So we're looking here uh, at sales figures and you can see uh, not surprisingly, perhaps, that the growth, major growth area has been Asia Pacific with the huge amount of growth that we've seen in China uh, from around 2010 onwards. And that has obviously spurred on soft drink sales in that market. North America and Europe, you can see there much more modest growth. But that's, again, perhaps not surprising considering that they are mature markets in this context. Latin America has seen some healthy growth figures as well. So really the main movers are uh, Asia Pacific and Latin America. But Asia Pacific, as you can see in absolute numbers and in terms of growth, is the place that most of the action is occurring. So here's another interesting graph uh, looking at soft drinks. Generally, global soft drinks growth entering a steady state. It says global growth rate in soft drinks as a general category is expected to improve only moderately in the coming years. So this is a projection you can see here to 2020. And it's fairly steady, fairly unspectacular growth that we're expecting to see in the coming years. So now we break it down by category and we're looking at some more forecasts here, but homing in on some of the separate categories that we've mentioned already. Bottled water is the major growth segment, it seems here, looking at this chart at least. And not surprising as well, carbonates are modest growth uh, in this context because there are many reasons which are affecting this, apart from the fact that it's a mature market. We're going to come back to that a little later on. But it's important to bear in mind there on the right, you can see this is actually the absolute figures in terms of market share. And the carbonates really still are way out ahead compared to the other segments. 
But if we're looking at growth and changes, bottled water and sports and energy drinks really are the big movers uh, expected in the coming years. And this, again, is a projection from 2015 to 2020. And this is globally. So this is taking into account all the various regions that we can expect changes to occur in in the coming years. Looking then at some more regional breakdowns uh, in terms of percentage of growth forecast for uh, 2021. You've got Asia at 47.2%, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, Western Europe then 9.2%, North America 8.7%, more modest uh, growth there. And again, Latin America expected to see some considerable growth there at 17.2%. Of course, all of these projections have to be taken with a pinch of salt because they're based on a whole, whole host of very, very hard to predict factors and variables. And of course, economic growth in those regions is going to be a key uh, factor in whether or not there is growth in this particular industry. That always has to be borne in mind. You can see here on the right, this is a breakdown, a qualitative breakdown of this analysis. The data shows an increasing volume migration from developed to emerging markets, not surprising there. North America and Western Europe are looking at slightly more modest growth in this, uh, in this uh, projection, this forecast, until 2021. Combined share, this is an important thing to bear in mind as well. Combined share of these markets, uh, that is to say Western Europe and North America, was nearly one third of global beverage consumption in 2000. Uh, this will have shrunk to 18% by 2021. So that just gives you a sense of how, the, uh, in, ter in relative terms, the European and North American markets are becoming less important from a global market share point of view. And Asia is really pushing on with uh, it projected to take 47.2% share in 2021. Now, let's just home in for a moment on the U.S. trends, because often it's the case that U.S. trends uh, kind of indicate or anticipate trends in the near uh, near future in other uh, developed nations. Often they're the first to signify changing consumer interests and changes that become replicated in other developed nations. And it's important then to look at soft drinks in particular. In particular, we're looking at carbonated soft drink consumption since 1987, right up until 2015. And this is per capita consumption, so it obviously takes into account changes in demographics and population. And the trend since 1997, roughly, is a bad one from the point of view of carbonated soft drink consumption per capita. It has really plummeted in the United States context. And that could be very important in the context of gen developing nations. Gener developed nations generally, we're going to see similar uh, figures, I expect, when you analyze the data from the last five to ten years in developed nations as well. Carbonated soft drink consumption per capita is on a fast decline. Here we're seeing it in terms of brand consumption. And this is a quite a telling little graph we have here. Demand for most big brands, it dropped in 2015 and dropped in very considerable numbers in many cases. You can see uh, Coke down 1%, Pepsi Cola minus 3.2%, Diet Coke a whopping minus 56 and Diet Pepsi as well. Uh, we're going to come back to the reasons why that might be the case a little later on. Mountain Dew at minus 2.8%, Dr. Pepper the only one apart from Sprite to see a, a positive growth, Dr. Pepper up by 0.1%. And Sprite, interestingly, and I think very tellingly, had growth of 3.3%. And it seems to be the case that this growth was based on the fact that Sprite has a better health perception amongst consumers. Because Sprite is one of the few completely clear liquid carbonated soft drinks, that clarity gives a perception of health to consumers, they associate it more with water, they associate it more with purity, they might think as a result that it has a lower sugar content, and for that reason it seems people who had, uh, for example, uh, associated negative uh, health associations with those drinks on the left, for example, like Pepsi Cola and Diet Coke and others, they may have shifted their consumption to Sprite as an alternative because they perceived it to be less uh, unhealthy. But of course, as many of you will know, Sprite actually has just as high a sugar content as all of the other soft drinks. And so that is purely a perception based shift. And it doesn't actually have a lot to do, it seems, with the objective properties of that particular uh, product. So we're going to come back to that later on. When we're talking about consumer attitudes and preferences. Looking here then at Asia, trends and projections for the coming years. Well, here we're f focusing primarily on the last 14 years in Asia. 
per capita per day sales of sugar sweetened beverages. So that covers all sorts of categories like fruit drinks, soft drinks and sports and energy drinks. And we've seen very healthy growth in Asia Pacific region over the last 10 years or so. And it looks likely that that will continue as those economies continue to move in a very strong positive direction in terms of GDP growth per year. Regional growth and forecasts here, again, we're breaking this down by region and we're focusing on carbonated soft drinks specifically up to 2020. And unsurprisingly, again, we're looking at Asia as the major areas of growth. The Middle East and Africa as well is going to see considerable growth in the carbonated segment. And then Latin America uh, is going to see some growth as well. Uh, but Europe, Australasia, Western Europe and North America, the very established mature markets are going to see much more modest and in fact perhaps negative growth figures to 2020 in terms of carbonated soft drinks. Now this is a really nice little graph to illustrate visually just how strongly the bottled water segment has come on in the last 15 to 20 years. This is looking at 19 from 1985 to 2014. Water is seriously gaining on soda that is to say carbonated soft drinks which are seeing considerable declines in terms of per capita consumption rates and it looks like water is set to overtake uh, soda in terms of consumption. And that really is a really strong indication of the increasing health consciousness of consumers, which we'll be coming back to a little later on. So now let's focus in on industry structure. And we're looking here again, this is focusing on the carbonated soft drink uh, operating model and the various, uh, the various areas of the supply chain and how they all link in together. It's a good, it's a really good little chart here to give you a sense of exactly how this industry is structured in terms of the supply line, where things are coming from and at what points things deviate and diverge. So you start up at the top here with the syrup producer. And we're gonna come back and discuss a little bit more about syrup producers because uh, syrup producers really hold a lot of the bargaining power in the real world industry at least. And this is important from the point of view of things like pricing and profit margins and operating profit. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. But here we're just looking at how things proceed through the supply chain. So you start with the syrup producer and they blend raw materials to form a syrup concentrate for a specific beverage. The next question that is asked then is, the, is the, the uh, drink that is going to follow on a diet beverage or is it not? And if it is not, then this syrup is packed immediately in its concentrated form without any additional uh, interference and ready for shipping. But if it is a diet beverage, then artificial sweeteners are actually added at this stage of the production process, that is to say prior to the distribution to the bottlers themselves. So here we have a pre-sweetening if it's artificial sweetening and if it's not artificial sweetening, then you, as you'll see below, the sugars are actually added by the bottlers themselves in the bottling plant. So they receive the syrup concentrate from the syrup producer. Again, the question is asked, is this a diet beverage? If it is not a diet beverage, then the sugar is added to, or the syrup is added, extra syrup is added to this particular concentrate. Then you have the addition of water and carbonates and put in the appropriate bottle or container. This is uh, for both diet and non-diet beverages. And then at the end, they're packaged and readied for shipment. The next question that is asked then is whether or not these are going to be shipped directly to a merchant. If the answer is no, then they're going to go to a distributor and they receive the product, repackage if necessary, and then they'll send them on to the merchant or final customer. And if yes, of course, then the bottler can also distribute directly to the merchandiser or the final consumer. So an important question to be asked, of course, at that point of the uh, of the supply chain is whether or not the uh, beverage company in question will outsource that distribution and logistics or whether they want to integrate it and become a vertically integrated uh, company. So there's a huge amount of potential in this industry for vertical integration right from the syrup production process to the uh, to the final distribution process but in the real world industry actually what you'll see is you see a lot of separation in terms of the syrup production being separate from the bottling and you see a lot of then licensing and franchising mediating between the relationship of the syrup producer to bottler so the supply chain is largely dependent on the syrup producer as you can see on the right here you have a nice little qualitative breakdown of what you're seeing on the left 
Uh, the supply chain is largely dependent on the syrup producer as this is the driver for most downstream operations. Locations of the uh, syrup manufacturers are closely linked to both the locations of strategic raw materials and major population cent- centers, for example, in the United States and or areas that see above average temperatures where demand for the soft drinks tends to be highest. So we're going to focus then on this syrup versus soft drink manufacturing distinction. So the soft drink industry as a whole is typically subdivided into into two sub-industries. You have the syrup concentrate manufacturer on the one hand, which is the first stage that we looked at just now, and then you have the soft drink manufacturer on the other. Typically, the former, that is to say the syrup manufacturing, concentrate manufacturing, is proportionately speaking much more profitable. Uh, for example, in the United States, revenues from syrup concentrate manufacturing are around $8 billion, while revenues from soft drink manufacture are around $50 billion. So you might think, oh, well, of course, the obvious industry to get into then is soft drink manufacturing. But when you look at the actual profit margins, very interestingly, in the former case, that is to say in syrup uh, concentrate manufacturing industry, Profits uh, stand at around 1.5 billion, while the latter only generates about 1.7 billion in total profits. So that's really telling when you look at the percentage of a uh, profit compared to uh, total revenues, much, much healthier margins in the case of the syrup concentrate manufacturing industry. So you might be wondering, well, why is that the case? Well, let's start on the left here. This gives a nice little overview and breakdown. Flavoring syrup and concentrate manufacturing industry uh, is an $8 billion industry in the United States based on revenue, and it was forecast to generate a profit of $1.4 billion. That was in 2010. And then you have below the soft drink manufacturing uh, industry is $47.2 billion industry, but a a profit profit, uh, uh, margin of $1.7 billion in 2010 in the same year. And the reason here is given on the right. So while the prospects for the flavoring syrup and concentrate industry in the United States are closely linked to the success of the soft drink manufacturing industry, it is projected to fare somewhat more favorably than the manufacturing industry from a profit perspective. The reason for this is that two highly recognizable companies dominate this industry, Coca-Cola and PepsiCo, and this power then allows the flavoring syrup and concentrate producers to pass on increases in input costs that might arise, and they pass them on to then the bottlers and they can then sustain very high margins. So it really is a kind of a contingent feature of the industry. It's just a reflection of the fact that you have these major multinational corporations with huge amount of bargaining power because they have these secret recipes in the form of their syrup concentrates, which they sell on then to these bottlers and they give them licenses and uh, the permission to uh, bottle on their behalf. And then they are the ones who have to shoulder any additional costs in the manufacturing process or for other reasons. And so that allows these companies, Coca-Cola and PepsiCo, to maintain incredibly healthy profit margins. Now, the issue of bottlers. So this is the other aspect of the industry. You have the concentrate, uh, syrup concentrate producers of PepsiCo and Coca-Cola, for example. And then you have the bottlers. So they're the next significant players in the life cycle of a carbonated soft drink. Bottler's main job is to mix the syrup produced by the syrup manufacturers with the appropriate ingredients and then bottle the soft drink in a variety of containers before packaging it for distribution. So uh, locations uh, of the bottlers follow a similar pattern to the locations of the syrup manufacturers. So, of course, naturally enough, it's in the interest of these bottlers to be within a short distance of the syrup manufacturers in order to cut down on transport costs and so on. So as you can see here again, this is the structure that you're looking at. The bottlers will receive the syrup and then ask the question, is this diet or beverage? If it is a a diet, then it's shifted straight on to the addition of carbonated waters and so on. And if not, then it is uh, the added sugars and so on are introduced into the mix. So this is a really key point here, of course, because you want to avoid any potential mix-ups and confusions and to uh, excuse the pun, but you might see bottlenecks occurring at these points if there's any kind of inefficiency in distinguishing in, uh, between uh, diet beverages versus non-diet beverages and syrups that need to be need to have sugars added versus syrups that do not need to have sugars added. Because remember, in the previous uh, in the previous a segment that we looked at in the in the process of the actual production of the concentrates uh, in the case of diet concentrates for di- concentrates for diet beverages uh, 
you had the artificial sweeteners added at that stage of the process. So if there is any kind of mix up, then you're going to end up with doubly sweetened uh, beverages if you make a mistake and you add sugar to, for example, a diet beverage concentrate. So it's very important that the bottler gets this process right, that they're very clear, uh, separate, uh, for example, um, assembly lines or production lines to ensure that there is no potential for confusion there, which could create serious bottlenecks. And then, of course, again, you have those questions being asked at this end as well. What are uh, diet and what are not diet? And you have to make sure that you don't make those kinds of mistakes there at that end as well. Distribution channels then, uh, we're looking at the breakdown of distribution and unsurprisingly, perhaps you can see at the bottom here, supermarkets and general merchandisers account for the uh, majority of distribution of soft drinks. And then the remaining, you can see here on the left, food and ser food services and drinking places, things like restaurants, for example, making up 20%. Then you have convenience stores and gas stations and then vending machines at 11%. So supermarkets and general merchandisers, the major players there in terms of distribution channels, getting those drinks to the final consumers. And so, of course, again, that brings in the issue of bargaining power. Bargaining power here for the supermarkets and general merchandisers is quite high. And it might be the case that that could lead to certain pricing problems. So really from both ends, if you're looking just at a bottler, if you're looking at these independent bottlers uh, as companies within this industry, really they do face quite a lot of pressure in terms of being squeezed from both ends by groups that have very large bargaining power. At least that's the case in the real world industry. So here again, you're looking at uh, a nice uh, overview of beverage operating model. You have the concentrate producer, then you have a fountain distributor and the final customer here. So it's, not, it's worth your while, again, just taking some time to look through that uh, process just to get a sense of how things proceed and the kind of logic of that flow. And then we're brought on to the issue of franchising and licensing, which is really crucial in this industry. A common business model in the industry has a soft drink company manufacture the syrup concentrate and then outsource the bottling and distribution to a licensed bottler. This is actually very common in the real world industry. This is kind of the norm. This is just, again, a reflection of the contingent fact that in this real world industry, PepsiCo and Coca-Cola company have such a major global influence in terms of syrup concentrate production. So they've both been uh, the ones who have kind of imposed this model in many ways on this industry. You've seen this separation of bottlers and syrup concentrate producers.